Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benny Cullen. I'm Director of Research and Innovation in Sport Ireland. I'm being asked to moderate this Pecha Kucha session. It's my first Pecha Kucha, so please bear with me. It sounds pretty intense, so good luck to all our speakers who are mm -hmm. speaking this afternoon. Um, I think it's seven minutes per presentation. We, we're scheduled for about eight speakers, but I think we're slightly fewer than that now in the end. It will give us a little bit of wiggle room time-wise, but I'll still try and be relatively tight on time for our speakers both virtually and um, here in place. Um, I'll stand up when the seven minutes are up, yeah, so you'll just get an idea of what case the agenda is wrapping up. Can the slides move along automatically? No, 20 there. seconds for 20 slides. Yeah. You, you saw your dogs. There you go. Yeah, so look, we'll try and keep the time as best we can, but if you're running over a bit, we might have a little bit of wiggle room there, we won't, be, we won't get the stage open for you on stage. <laughs> um, we've 90 minutes in total, yeah, so I hope we finish around half five, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, and to begin, um, I let each speaker introduce themselves. I'll just call the speakers up. I think we're beginning with uh, Eduarda Aun, who's with us online. Thanks a lot for joining us, Eduarda. We might just check that we can hear and see you. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> we certainly can. Um, so I believe Shane, our IT guru here is going to get your slides up and running. So you'll be able to see what Shane. Yeah. So is. Edward, if, you, if you can just click down the bottom, uh, down beside the settings icon, I'll just share your screen. Yep. Um, and to begin, Edward, we might just let you give a little introduction to yourself and what you're going to speak about, um, and then we'll get you uh, kickstarted into the Okay, perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Edward Daon, and I'm a program manager at the Global Designing Cities Initiative. Today I'll be talking about interim street transformation in the self-built neighborhood of Jaji Monte Verde, which is in Recife in Brazil. And this was a collaboration between us and the Recife City Hall and Traffic Agency and the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety. And so Jaji Monte Verde is a low-income neighborhood that's in the outskirts of Recife in the southernmost part of the city. And the goal of this project was to create uh, a safe environment for pedestrians uh, by reducing uh, speeds and creating a safe space for them. So informal neighborhoods like Jaji Bonchevegi actually form a large portion of Hisiki's built fabric, occupying over 30% of the city's urban area and housing more than half of the population. These neighborhoods are usually densely populated and oftentimes they lack just basic infrastructure such as sidewalks and public spaces. And so this is the, the site area and it was this huge intersection that was surrounded by local retail and houses, but also a healthcare facility and three public schools. So there was a lot of children walking around this area in the middle of fast moving cars, rendering it pretty dangerous. Uh, this is a community that's highly dependent on walking, cycling, and taking public transit. As you can see, there are no sidewalks, and so most of the population really just relies on the street to walk and to do their everyday travels. And uh, the lack of infrastructure combined with fast-moving cars, motorcycles, and buses coming up and down this hill uh, created an environment where the people on um, you can see in this picture on the on the right didn't feel very safe so most of the residents surveyed said that they did not feel safe sharing the space with the vehicles in the street and so his has been uh in the past couple of years largely investing in promoting and protecting active modes of transportation and they've been doing this through uh these interim interventions that they call tactical urbanism in order to achieve their road safety um, and mobility goals. And so these are many of the projects that the city has been doing and Jaji Monchevegi was one of them. And so in this context, the city uh, decided to engage the population of, the, of this neighborhood. Uh, they conducted a many uh, surveys and uh, did a lot of metrics collections to understand the challenges, but also the opportunities of the area. And through different interviews and meetings, they are also able to collect uh, people's needs and desires for this neighborhood. And so here's just another picture of the area. And as you can see, this is a very wide intersection. Most of the space really just for cars, a lot of asphalt. And it's interesting that you can note that we have like some cars and trucks here on this part, which are really creating barricades for the residents uh, to meet and convene and play, realize their events um, on this area. And so this is the space transformed. Like I mentioned before, the goal of this project was to reduce speed, so we created a slow speed zone, but it was also, uh, we also wanted to create a safe and attractive space 
for this community to gather and to have all of their different uh, community events. And so we did this in a low cost, quick uh, approach. Oops. And uh, with this project, with this design, we were able to reclaim over 700 square meters of space for pedestrians. We added benches and tables and trees and created this really lively space uh, for the community to meet, but especially for the children in this neighborhood to play. Um, and like I mentioned before, this the presence of these three public schools in the neighborhood really attracted a lot of kids to the area. So it was the design really incorporated a lot of play and learning elements so the kids that are going to and from school um, could have more spaces for them to play and learn in their daily journeys. And so after the intervention, uh, the team collected a lot of metrics to see what were the impacts of this design in the neighborhood. And we found that we had 98% fewer pedestrians walking on the roadbed near this area. So with the addition of crosswalks and sidewalk extensions in this big public space, now our pedestrians are protected and moving safely. Uh, with this new design, we were also able to create a way more compact uh, intersection. And so we found an 80% reduction in crossing distance before people had to cross like up to 35 meters um, unprotected. And so we were able to reduce that to seven meters um, in some spots and less in others. And likewise, uh, through this design, we were also able to achieve this, uh, this situation and we have in which we have no more children walking or being carried on the roadbed. Uh, we all know that the children are one of the most vulnerable street users. And so for us, it was really important to create these safe spaces for children to cross and walk. Um, and this was really big compared to the number that we had before. Uh, one of the things that we also did with this design intervention was reduce the speed limit, which was unregulated before. Um, and so th through that and through the different traffic calming strategies like lane narrowings and speed bumps, we were able to get to a 50% reduction in vehicles ex exceeding that speed limit. As a consequence, the perception of safety also changed. And so after the intervention, uh, we realized that over 80% of pedestrians started to feel safe or very safe towards vehicles. And that was also a pretty big uh, change, especially when we had uh, the opposite happening before where 84% felt unsafe or very unsafe in this area. And so I can't uh, highlight enough how the success of this project was really due to the team on the ground and the Hasifi Traffic Agency. Uh, you can see them highlighted in this photo here on the left and how engaged they were in engaging the community throughout the process um, during the implementation and even distributing these plants to the neighbors which really made the the residents more feeling more, more welcome in this project so to finish up i just wanted to say how uh, these interim strategies can be a really great opportunities for cities to test these bold street designs to collect metrics and to gather input from the community um, of course this is we know that there are some challenges, but this is a really good way of scaling up and affecting more areas throughout the city through these low cost, quick interventions. Uh, of course, we also know that there's still a long path ahead um, in ensuring that these communities have access to urban infrastructure and access to quality public spaces. But we know how these have been really strategic for the city to achieve the road, cra road traffic um, goals and their sustainable mobility goals as well. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Eduarda. The um, excellent presentation, and um, yeah, I think you've set the standard for the Pecha Kuta. So good luck to all our all our other speakers, um, uh, and thanks a lot for joining us. I think what we'll do is we'll run through the presentation. So if anybody has any questions, maybe keep note of them. The, um, hopefully, you can stick with us, Eduarda, for the duration. Um, and we'll come to questions at the end, the emotional process to keep moving forward with our agenda. All right, everybody. Okay, next up, we have Mary Dillon, Dr. Mary Dillon, who's going to speak to us about uh, a technological exploration of landscape and long distance walking processes on the Dingle Way. I'm so polishing my badge. <laughs> now, do I get to see here? Sure, you're sure. Sure. Right up there and Shane controls him so every 20 seconds. Then yeah, but that's fine. On. We'll yeah. give you a little chance to give a little introduction first, if that's all right, Mary. And yeah. then we start showing yeah. your slides. No, I sorry. just, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, my name is Mary Dillon. I'm a TU lecturer here on the Sport and Leisure Management Program. I'm a very keen walker and um, particularly long distance walker, walker uh, of recent years. And I've just completed a PhD 
on the long distance walking experience. So my research is uh, based on that. What I've done for you is presented some photos, but also some quotations from the research so that you're actually getting the, the actual opinions and um, experiences from the walkers themselves collected um, over two summers, in fact. <laughs> so I might get you to, can you reverse? No? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I've always been interested in the role of walking and uh, the role of landscape that landscape plays in walking, uh, particularly for the mood and the atmosphere it creates along the trail. And I've often felt that this is an element that we don't always take uh, into account when we're planning our walks. We're so focused on accommodation, getting from A to B, the logistics, etc. Um, I've chosen the Dingle Way because it was voted 14th out of the 20 most popular walks um, in Europe in a recent survey. Uh, it has spectacular mountain uh, scenery and it is 170 kilometres long. As you can see there, it extends right down the Dingle, Dingle Peninsula. You can approach it from a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction. It takes uh, seven to eight to nine days. To, to complete, and most walkers take that time. Um, my research was approached from three theoretical perspectives, the embodied walking and wayfinding. Um, I also looked at affect theory, I was looking at the sounds, the tactile sensations, the, uh, the atmosphere on the trail that affected the walking, and also particularly looking at the weather and effect of atmospheres, because I feel that is very much integral to the landscape experience. The research suggests that there are five different ways in which uh, walkers experience landscape. The first is through the basic wayfinding. The second is through the experiences that the landscape affords along the way. The third, as I say, is the impact of the weather and how that affects the atmosphere of the trail each day. Historical sites and the trails then as transcendent spaces. In wayfinding, the walkers learn to read the landscape as they progress becoming immersed in the Driffel Trail environments and generating their own individual journeys, depending on the mood, the terrain encountered, and the happenings and events along the way. In wayfinding, the landscape dictates the walking. It detects the physical pace of the walking, which is both enhancing and disrupting. It changes the rhythms. It produces feelings of elation, but also feelings of tiredness and uh, with aching muscles at the end of each day. And while walking each day, the landscape also affords daily rituals and activities such as meditating, observing farming and fishing practices. Watching sheep was one of the more popular activities of the walkers and engaging in embodied activities such as climbing, blackberry picking, taking selfies, watching sunsets. All of the things that we actually build into a trail experience and don't, don't really account for. Uh, the beaches themselves also presented trail spaces that afforded lots of different activities, such as collecting shells, swimming, uh, paddling, surfing, uh, watching the seals, and listening to the sounds of the ocean. And it was, uh, you know, for our continental walkers, it was these spaces that they really appreciated when they don't have them on their own back door, or, you know, what's in their own environment. Uh, the panoramic sea views of the Atlantic, and of course the Dingle Way is surrounded by Atlantic sea views. And these were for walkers a very rare sight, and they expressed a sense of calm and awe, both at the power of the waves and at the restorative moments that the sea uh, generated. <coughs> so to sum up, these variety of landscape tracks and trails, from farm tracks to mountain passes, elicited diverse walking rhythms and styles and revealed how the walkers and dictated to some extent how the walkers engaged every day with the trail as they moved along the peninsula. The elements of weather are another category that really affects how the walkers experience the landscape and the weather elements contribute to the ways we perceive the world around us and particularly the landscapes that we travel through and as the weather changes so does our capacity to perceive different things, but also to perceive things differently. And the West of Ireland light was one of the maybe highlights for a lot of walkers, the changing atmospheres that it created on an hourly basis, opening up the vistas, 
changing the qualities in the landscape and enhancing the perception of it. And in contrast, there were days which were not so bright, days of fog which foreshortened the depth and transcendence of the landscape, closing in the views which disappointed a lot of walkers, but which actually created a magical vibe for others and a, a different experience. Landscapes, as always, all over the world take, tell stories and the Dingle landscape tells particular stories, revealing through the archaeological main, remains and the historic sites the life and times of those who have lived and dwelled in them. And these ancient settlements on the trail allowed walkers to reflect on the passing of time in our lives. And in moving through these archaeological sites and deserted spaces, walkers reimagined the ancient settlements to life and interpreted them in the context of their own lives, bringing the past into the present. Walking through these landscapes opened up the historical and geological perspectives on the world and allowed walkers to reflect on their own place in life. And I suppose that was one of the most significant elements that came through in my research, this idea of landscapes as transcendent spaces, allowing people to look at life, to respond uh, in a meditative way, and reminding them of how fragile uh, our place in the world is. And I'll just leave you then with some of those quotes. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mary, and well done also. Um, um, that was excellent in Thingle Peninsula. Many would have been there, but it's a place very close to my own heart. Yeah, so really interesting to see that research and a, a great perspective that you've brought there to try and understand how people live those experiences when they go with those walks. So thanks a lot for that. I'm sure there might be some questions later on. Um, We'll keep trucking along if that's okay with everybody. And um, we have a little change in the schedule now. And we have two speakers, Antonio Oliveira and Najwa Dugman, the, um, who are, I think, is it a similar project you're speaking about in terms of the interim street transformation, speed reduction strategies, downtown, downtown corridor, Rua da Palma in Brazil. You're both very welcome. We'll give you a couple of minutes to do an introduction and then we'll end. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just do a short intro that um, I'm just filling in for the team who actually worked on this project. Uh, we wish they could be here too, um, the team from Recife, and so we're lucky that uh, Antonio was able to fly over from Recife, Brazil, and we'll share this project. Good evening. Uh, my name is Antonio Henrique. I work with Tadja Recife. Um, Today, uh, today about, uh, I'm going to about in the Rua Problem Projects in Recife, a tactical urban intervention by Maitra in Recife, a city in the north of Brazil. Today, I will, with, uh, I will with Nadia uh, Dogman, represent GDCI, uh, your partner to make the project happen. I feel going to the presentation. <laughs> Sorry, my English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the past few years, Recife has experienced a great formation, transformation, uh, consult mainly in the information protection in the PV models and of transport. Thanks, Antonio. Um, 
So this project that we're going to talk about um, in Hisifi is uh, a busy commercial street located in uh, San Antonio's, uh, the neighborhood of San Antonio and Hisifi's downtown. Um, so before the street transformation projects, you'll see here that 83% of people felt unsafe walking around this area, and so it was very important to intervene. Um, they felt that way because of high volumes of vehicles and not enough safe facilities for pedestrians. Um, and in the same survey, 81% um, of people uh, that were interviewed agreed that pedestrians should be prioritized uh, here. And this was especially pertinent because, um, you know, pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users are the majority of street users here. So almost um, three quarters of the people arrived here uh, using sustainable transportation modes when we Um, and despite these high volumes, you'll see that the space allocation of the street did not reflect uh, this split. And so um, just 33% of the space was dedicated to the streets. And one of the biggest uh, impacts of the intervention um, was to shift the space allocated for pedestrians from 33% to 66%. Uh, and this was key to showing that pedestrians were going to be the priority from now on uh, in this area and meet uh, people's expectations that were expressed. And the strategy uh, used here to transform the space and reduce speeds um, and give more room for vulnerable users uh, was through an interim uh, street transformation project. It was a relatively low cost, quick transformation uh, with a high impact. And this method, sometimes referred to as tactical urbanism, enables people to see the potential of the space before building it permanently. So with some paint and the support of the local signage and markings team, um, over a thousand square meters uh, were reclaimed for pedestrians in a matter of days. And benefits could be seen even uh, before the implementation was completed. <coughs> so the sidewalk extensions enabled a 62% reduction uh, of the crossing distance, which we know reduces pedestrians' exposure to traffic um, and directly improves road safety. And some studies show that each additional meter in a pedestrian um, crosswalk uh, is correlated with a 6% increase in the number of pedestrian crashes. So it's important to reduce that risk. Another metric that shows road safety improvements is the change in number of people walking um, exposed uh, on the roadbed. And so in Juan de Palma, there are now 85% less people walking outside of protected facilities. Taking an even closer look at the breakdown of the vulnerable street users, observations showed um, that kids were now walking within uh, protected facilities. No more of them were being carried in the roadbed compared to 9.6% uh, before. As we know, uh, we've heard in other sessions, kids um, you know, feeling welcome and safe in a space is always a great indicator of it being appropriate for everybody. Um, so often the main goal of our project focuses on speed reduction. Um, and this project achieved the 97% compliance rate with the 30 kilometer per hour uh, posted speed limits, making the area safe for all users. And in addition to the design changes, um, was implementation of things such as street furniture and other placemaking elements. Uh, so in total, there were 10 benches, uh, 10 bike racks, and 20 planters uh, that were implemented across the site. And the street furniture, along with the added space um, and the traffic calming measures, improve the public space quality and make the area more inviting for people not only to walk, uh, but to stay a little longer and, and gather and sit and, and meet each other and create this community. Uh, And we can really look at um, road safety projects in a more comprehensive uh, lens because they bring these other co-benefits uh, of improving public space activities, being more inclusive of different ages and abilities and, and modes. Um, so you can see here some more uh, photos from that. And interventions in, in commercial areas, as I'm sure many of you know, um, often receive a lot of complaints from the businesses, the small businesses, um, and, and Rio de Palma was no different in the beginning. Uh, but after the implementation, uh, some local businesses were even asking for the intervention to extend to adjacent blocks and um, that shows that they, they saw the benefits of it. 
Um, and so because of all the strategies, like narrowing the travel lanes, shortening the crossing distances, and reducing the speeds, 71% um, of people then expressed that they felt safe or, or very safe uh, crossing the street and feeling um, more welcome in the space. So in addition um, to street transformations, like with the Pelma, other strategies of traffic enforcement, <laughs> communication and data collection, um, and analysis contributed to the reduction of the number of pedestrian deaths by 25% uh, between 2020 and 2021. Um, and so due to the commitment of, of the city um, and the support of the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety, which is also part of uh, projects like this one were scaled up uh, across the city. Um, and Antonio and Eduardo, who's online, can tell you more about it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the video uh, uploads the site, yeah, Robert, uh, tomorrow. So. Yeah, there's there's a video about the project that will be on YouTube tomorrow, um, the complete project. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Antonio and Najan. Another really interesting project that certainly, I think we've seen it in Ireland, but with a lot of value in those rapid tactile interventions that seem to be creating more open space and more space for people to walk. And it's great to see it being measured and researched and evaluated to such an extent to provide the evidence for, for future work in the space. The, um, and no doubt we'll get a, a few questions later on. We keep trucking along. We're doing great on time. Mario, you're up next. The, um, yes. Mario Alves is going to bring out an Orwellian perspective to all this. The Exploring Transport <laughs> Double Speak, the importance of storytelling in changing people's minds. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this was a proposal for a session, but I got put in Mr. Kucha and the colleague yesterday said, are oh, you going to talk about language in seven minutes? You're crazy. And I agreed with her. So this is Wittgenstein in seven minutes. <laughs> um, yes, I'm uh, uh, Secretary General of the International Federation of Pedestrians. We are about 50 organizations uh, um, around the world, NGOs, and people that are fighting for pedestrian rights in about 40 countries. So if in your country you don't have any NGOs for the right of pedestrians, please contact us. We are on social media. You'll see me and uh, how to speak to us about. Um, and I will be speaking about words and storytelling. Um, and uh, we have seen a lot of uh, ideas that um, people should uh, start uh, measuring. And you have a lot of statistics. But from my experience, uh, probably facts don't change a lot of minds. Uh, it depends on the context and uh, stories do. So that's where I will uh, speak about this. So um, as Arari have been uh, writing, uh, very popular around the world, we are the only mammals that share stories. And with stories, we are able to collaborate, we are able to share ideas, and we are able to create groups and critical mass so that we just uh, trottle around. And that's how the car and car dome uh, really created culture. And I'm very, very interested in looking at technology and see there is always a story behind. There is always a point of view, as you can see. And I will speak about words, similes, metaphors, and paradigms. Uh, but I will come to that later. But as you see, there is always, always a point of view, even on technology. So be aware that when you are in public space, there is always a point of view. So words, which are the build building blocks of stories, uh, you know that just a few years ago, non-motorized ways, you still uh, non-motorized modes is still used very much. Maybe we should prefer active modes. Everybody knows that by now. Vulnerable road user, maybe we should start using des desirable road user. And road safety and accident. I'll speak about that one a little bit more. And we probably prefer road danger reduction. Why? And uh, road safety. Road safety is a little bit of an example of double speak from George Orwell, right? Because they are studying about road, road danger. It doesn't sound very sexy to call that way, right? So, <laughs> in a way, uh, they are speaking about road safety, which is not really about road safety. And this was a science that was invented in the 1950s, and we are still using that. So that's why we prefer road danger reduction, which is calling a spade a spade. And words, this is quite an old, everybody knows about this. 
And good news, we have someone representing IFP, International Federation of Pedestrians at the Global Forum for Road Safety. And after many years of fighting, we actually now, are, the reports are starting to use the word crash instead of accident. And as you know, accidents are only a tiny part of the crashes, a very, very tiny part of the crashes. When you look at this, you say this congestion is, uh, this um, intersection is congested. No, it is not. You don't see a lot of pedestrians here. So it's always from the point of view. And here you see jaywalking. And that's probably, as many of you know, jaywalking is jay is, is someone from the countryside that doesn't know how to use the city. So it was a word introduced by the car um, industry. This is a, a bridge from Lisbon, where I come from. And there is all these helicopters in the morning relating about congestion. And they always say that the bridge is congested. No, it is not, because there is a train underneath full of empty seats. And nobody speaks about it. So it's very, very important to understand, even in the press, in the you know, newspapers and radio and TV, we have a minister that hit the pedestrian. And the, the, the press release was the car of the, the minister suffered an accident. So that, that was an interesting one. So basically, and we have members all over the world uh, dealing with this. This is Liga Petonal in Mexico, and it says up there, this is not for pedestrians uh, in Spanish. They are in Mexico, I think, and they do a lot of uh, work in challenging uh, these pedestrian bridges. So if you go to their website, you will see that they have a campaign against pedestrian bridges that are all over the world. So these are very important. So go easy on words and don't use a lot of bullet points. Um, and that's where I start being a little bit more interested in neuropsychology and how it works when you start telling stories. So basically, when you use words, you only activate two parts of the brain. There is one part that is about language. And there is one part that is about the movement that our, for the communicator, the movement that the, the, the tongue and the mouth has to do to say the words. But when you tell a story, then things change dramatically. Because then uh, there is like a firework inside of the brain. So there is smell, there is movements, and there is all kinds of things that happen in the brain. And actually, that's where you, there is a lot of research on this, that where people start changing their minds. So when you see a story, an image like this, you can almost smell the beer, you can hear the sirens of the police, and you wonder what's going on here. Yeah, it's, it's a funny photo. Um, but, you know, and one thing we know is when we speak about words like cinnamon or soap or lavender, we know that parts of the brain work. So we have stimulus, which are just saying, Walkers are like red blood cells, metaphors, which actually are a micro story. And we have paradigms, which is what we really want to change. And that's indeed what happens. So what we know is when we are telling stories is basically uh, very interesting because when you speak about action verbs like uh, Pedro kick the ball, we know by uh, neuro sensors that actually the movement of the leg moves, okay? So actually, there is even more interesting things. When someone is telling a story, the brain waves and the function of the, the person that is telling the story coincides with the brain waves and the, of what is going on on the audience. So there is like a synchronicity. So basically, another thing that happens is for example, let me give you an example just to finish, like Vision Zero, which is all over the world, is not very successful in most of the cases without the Scandinavian discipline. Uh, it is a story about reducing to zero the uh, number of fatalities. If your ambition is that you are not killed on public space, it's really a poor <laughs> and sad ambition, right? So you probably have to change things. And this is a, a quote by Exuberi. And he says that if you want to change people's minds, don't give them a list of PowerPoints or bullet points uh, explaining what they have to do, like a list of nails and hammers if they want to build a ship. What you have to do is take them to the beach and show them 
the beauty and the immensity of the sea and the adventures of Ulysses and all this outside um, on the outside world. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mario, and indeed, I think the format lends itself well to avoiding lists of bullet points on a PowerPoint presentation and more storytelling and, and imagery, so thanks a lot for your presentation. I'm going to turn to my back up here in, in Shane, um, I think you have a presentation from Louise, but is Louise here, or maybe she's joining us online? Not our Louise, don't worry, the, um, yeah, 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 I could see the, the, the quick glance going, not me, I <laughs> The next one I have is a photo of a woman and two brains. Is that anyone's? I can put up on screen here now. Any other speakers due in this room? No, nobody else due to come up and speak. Everything was going so smoothly until now. The, um, anybody else due to speak? No. And have we got anybody else online? Uh, Shane? I'll have a look see now. No one else new online. Okay. Um, we did have another few speakers due. We were wondering if they would turn up or if they'd either turn up virtually or in person. It does mean what we can do is maybe move to a couple of questions if people do have any questions for any of the speakers. Is Eduarda still with us? Is she still online? She is, yeah. Fantastic. Um, Eduarda, thanks for sticking with us. So just a quick reminder, Eduarda's presentation was on the interim street transformation strategies in the self-built neighborhood, that beautiful picture of that, um, you know, greatly redeveloped junction in Manown, Judge to Clay and people to South Brighton Street <laughs> Landscapes. Mary, who gave us the really interesting perspective on the, I suppose, the experience of walking along the incredible Dingle Way. Um, we had Antonio and Nadja, who presented on the interim street transformations in Brazil. Um, and then we had Mario with his Orwellian perspective of, uh, of the transport doublespeak and the use of language. Um, is this anyone's presentation up there? Someone here. Okay. Let's go on to the next one. I might put it to the floor to begin with, if anybody has any questions for any of those four speakers. Ian. And we have quite a bit of time now, given that there's a few presentations not turning up. Ian, so we could have a bit of a discussion, and then hopefully we get finished well in advance of the final part. So up to you guys to begin, if you have any questions on your presenter so far. I don't know. I have a question for Antonio and Nadia. Uh, you have uh, been talking about the uh, crash, right? <laughs> it was reduced. What, uh, what, what is it uh, in the number? I mean, what is the crash rate right? in, the, in the street? The measure was it one? Well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think from memory, was it was like a 20 or 25 percent reduction in pedestrian yeah. fatalities. Yeah. Yeah. I think the problem also is between 1920 and 21 are very odd years forever. Yeah. <laughs> so we will never be able to compare. From so we we'll have to wait a little bit more. Yeah, right. Usually these things are measured over longer periods, I think. And that was, I think, from 2020 to 2021. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, it's more. <laughs> My question would be for Eduardo. Yeah. Also, to see. Uh, there was a little bit, we can see that we did before and after the reduction of plastic. Usually, Europe is very emotional. It's the worst thing yeah. you can do. Uh, there were protests about the reduction of parking. Uh, I think it was like an answer, also, so she was involved in most projects. Did you hear the question, Eduardo? Sorry, it's really hard for me to hear. If you could repeat what they asked. Um, and and uh, Mario, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase Mario if you don't mind. And, and, um, um, so Mario was asking on whether there was any resistance in the interventions, these kind of temporary interventions of the urban realm. And um, was there any resistance from the reduction of parking spaces that are available to, to cars? Yeah, and what kind of resistance do you experience related to that? 
Okay, thank you for the question. I also wanted to say, I don't know if the Mahdi that asked was the same one that presented. I thought that was an interesting presentation. I was even thinking, oh, I said vulnerable road users and maybe desirable road users would have been better. Um, so really good food for thought for how we're presenting this. Um, but about the question, of course, I think in all these interventions, I think one of the main uh, challenges that we have is in taking away parking. Um, and so for both of the projects, that was definitely a point of contention. But I think through like the conversations and the negotiations that we were having and involving the community, we were able to, again, talk a little bit about what were the benefits that we would have in, 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 in reducing the parking so that we could give more space to the pedestrians, to the kids that were using the space. And at the end, um, you know, when we when we put this in perspective, I think uh, we were able to get to a, yeah, to a, to a, what do you say, to a, yeah, to a good place in which everyone was happy with what we were doing. And I think even, especially for the, the project of Huda Pama, where we had a lot of commercial activity, I think in the beginning, like Najwa and Antonio were saying, there was a lot of resistance from the shop owners, but once they saw how that was really also benefiting them, even without the, you know, with a little bit less of parking, um, they were more accepting of the project and embracing it. So I think engagement was a really important thing, and it always is, um, to deal with these situations. Um, any other questions from the floor? Yeah, Mary? I'd, I'd be very interested in the sustainability of projects like that. And what is the time frame that was envisioned? Was it very specifically COVID related? Or is it um, an initiative now that is being taken up and maybe expanded? In, in other cities, you know, how how is the how is what is the plan going forward? Is it to roll something like this out to more communities and and, and win back maybe more street space for for residents? Could you hear that, Eduardo? Yeah. And yeah. Feel free to chime in as well. Okay, we'll let you go first, Eduardo. Okay, yeah, I think that's a, a really good question too. We always get asked about that. Like, what is the time frame? Are there plans for this to become permanent? I think right now in the city, they are using this as a strategy to um, get to more areas uh, in the interim. But I, we always do encourage and say that this is just a step to get to that like, more permanent stage in which they will have like, uh, yeah, just harder surfaces and they won't be using these uh, soft uh, interventions. But like I said in my presentation, this is a good opportunity to test the street designs, to get that, to, to demonstrate these projects to the community so that they can see that this can be reversible, it can be changed. Um, so it's more of an intermediate stage with, uh, before they get to a final project. So like, I, I'll let Najwa and Antonia maybe speak about what the plans for the city are, but I know we know that this has been included in like the city's budgets for, so other, this one not specifically, but other projects um, are going into final or more permanent um, stages of the, of the intervention. Yeah, I can just add more generally about our approach. Um, that we, we do say that, you know, interim projects are very, very useful, but, you know, maybe they're not always appropriate. Sometimes you might go straight to capital construction, but when you do go to an interim uh, model, it's usually, as Eduardo mentioned, like to test the specific design or materials or like to engage the community or to try something new that before you implement it permanently. And so the intention is always for it to become permanent or to like use this model and this design and this study. Um, so we collect a lot of data. And we have two uh, handbooks that just came out uh, that I'm happy to circulate also about um, this process and how measuring data afterwards is important so we can learn from it and, and go towards a more sustainable uh, project. Um, can I ask, what's the what's the catalyst for the interim intervention? So does it come from local communities who advocate to local politicians, or does it come from you know structured bureaucracy of local authorities that say actually we need to do something about this area? What's the what's the catalyst that leads to the, the initial um, you know interim intervention? So I oh sorry, Nigel, were you going to say something? No, no, I was going to say it varies. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing that it really depends. I think in this in these projects that we um, shared today, it came from the city as noticing sometimes that they're like crash hotspots comes a lot from like the data that's um, analyzed beforehand of like what are these uh, critical areas that need to be changed. But I think many times it also comes from demands from communities 
um, who want to change their neighborhoods and streets. Um, any more questions from you guys? Related to time frame, um, one of the problems we have here in Europe with um, tactical urbanism is lack of maintenance. And after, after a few months, things degrade very quickly. Uh, is that something that you have like any budget for maintenance? So that's definitely something that also always comes up. I think we always, um, when we're talking to cities about these implementations, it's really important to budget that, um, uh, yeah, what's going to be used for, for maintenance of these spaces. Um, I think that's still something that some cities are dealing with and figuring out what the best way um, to going about. And maybe also I'll ask Najib, who's been working on in the interim um, booklet that we developed to talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, I think it depends on the city. Um, it's definitely something that we've been pushing for uh, more and more. And uh, I work primarily on projects in Ecuador. And so the way that we formulated kind of the agreement with the city was um, we require kind of like a six month maintenance period commitment from the city afterwards, because once the paint starts to fade or, you know, the planters get moved around sometimes and if no one's following, it just becomes um, not legible and cars are driving on top of the pedestrian spaces and we don't want to make it less safe. So um, in the city of Quito, for example, we have like a six month uh, memorandum uh, MOU with the city. Um, in other cities, it's less formalized, but we might like, hire a maintenance company or, you know, for a certain amount of time. But once it starts to fade and maintenance is no longer happening, then the project should be removed and we should think about the next step. It's permanent or it's just not you can simply transform permanent the artists with the main words. I vocabulary. You're doing great, Antonio. You're doing great. You're doing an awful lot better than we'd be doing in Spanish or Portuguese. So um, it's great work. Um, a question I have for, for Mary. So this study that you did in terms of, you know, the experience of, you know, something like the Dingle Way, even you know, how people um, express that and kind of yeah, you live through that. Um, do you think those kinds of studies and that kind of phenomenological perspective to, to, to what people are going through the outdoors, could, could that be applied to an urban environment? You know, that same study methodology to try and understand actually how it is that people see their environment and kind of to feed into some of these um, potentially interim solutions or even more long-term I think so. I think so. And there is, there has, you know, there is a lot of, of literature now and on walking and particularly city walking experiences. Okay. And I think people are looking at, at what is the experience. And I suppose that's what I'm struck by in the whole walking debate that it's often coming from the top down. You know, health budgets, which are planning on our health, congestion in our cities, but actually, you know, taking from the perspective of the walker, you know, looking at the perspective or looking at the projects that, you know, are based around and developed around access to schools. You know, if you actually hone in on those, you know, and, and gather research from people who are experiencing, and we saw some on this morning on, on some of the video clips with our Greenways in Dublin. I think it was in Dr. Otomay's presentation where she had some video clips of trains or new transport for our new one. Um, but but it, yeah, I think feedback from users is 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 the key because right across the research, you know, they're the missing link yeah. you know, to a large extent. Yeah. Um, now the train there is good research on train Camino particularly and like the Camino, you know, would have developers and organizers and planners would have worked on that feedback. Um, but I don't think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our urban landscapes, as we saw this morning, our city trails need cleaning up, in, we need to bring the countryside into the city, and we need to create an environment that is attractive for people. Moving cars out is one, giving more space is a second, but there's a whole third layer of planting up increased seating, making it to social spaces. That you know were, were referred to this morning because you will find people who spend more time outdoors, they will chat more with their neighbors, and any of the research that you do with urban parks, because I think the urban parks research gives a lot of that feedback of 
if you have green areas in, 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 in cities, people will you know, move into the green areas, spend more time. If we all go on holidays, we see how our Mediterranean um, you know, colleagues, colleagues and, and, and city dwellers are out promenading um, in either the parks or, or, or the sea, open sea spaces. And it's, it's the, ultimately, I think it's the same experience. You know, we, we get out, we like to move. The rhythm of walking is what you know, generates the health benefits, relaxes us, we chat. Um, and it's, it's, it's we as citizens are walkers. You know, we, there's, um, there's also definitely a piece in Niall Moyne I mentioned earlier on you know, that we tend to bring our middle class perspective and eyes to these problems that we try to solve and that actually understanding the experience of the single mother who's living in a two bed flat with yes. three or four children and you know, trying to get out and use that environment or what that feels like to them from an experience perspective would be very, very different to what it feels like to the yeah, to, to some And I think that, you know, that type of study allows us to try and, you know, understand that. Yes. And, and I, I struggle, I don't think being a little more point, I was really struck in Dublin with the COVID, the disparity of the amenities that were developed in different parts of the city. I think some people in some parts of the city had a terrifically positive experience because the local authorities got out to put money where it needed. There were some photographs on the paper and the contrast of you know what was actually rolled out. So I think this really EU initiative to direct governments on to how to maybe restructure our cities, restructure our communities, is probably what we need. So there's a better informality. But I'm not so sure it goes down to a social class. I think it goes down to what is available for people when they step out yeah. their front door. So there's a recent study of bike lanes. I think it's in <laughs> Germany, possibly, somewhere around a mainland Europe. And it was actually based on the fact that. I think you've told me this story, Benny Bullen. Uh, I'm claiming it as my own. Uh, where um, most of the planners and engineers involved in the delivery of the bike lanes were all men. So the bike lane was straight into the centre of town. Whereas any that had any female influence had bike lanes that were going off into different directions to accommodate childcare, to accommodate shopping, whatever it was. Whereas with the bike lanes designed by men, it's straight into work, straight back out of home. And it's it's and it is touching on that having the different voices around the table, not just social class, but actually just incorporating a little bit of variation that will really accommodate people that you're trying to do with yeah. you're trying to support. Them. And age groups, you know, some age groups very massive, but American research actually, and they are their research is more in urban areas, it's more related to parks because they concentrate a lot of recreation in parks. But yeah, I mean age, you know, you know if you if you have an immunity for for people in their nineties, <coughs> they will be out and they will be walking. And as we saw this morning, once it's accessible and safe, it's um you know, we, we, we tend to make imprison people, you know, it's three lanes. I mean I'm actually living on on a lovely leafy road but I'm on one of these proposed bus corridors. So um, when I come outside my door, maybe in three years' time, I will have instead of two lanes of traffic and lovely wide footpaths for our lovely children to scooter to school on, I will have a small footpath and I have four lanes of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, there's, I, we, need, we need to, I think, approach it from the user, you know, yeah. and, and the citizen is the, is the user. Okay. Can I can I just comment on this? Uh, yeah. Simplifying. Some people, you know, there are papers about this. That there are network um, design, yes. but there is space-wise design. So if you are dealing with children or people that are elderly or people that are at home, uh, it's much better to space-wise design so that you have like you know like the macro blocks in Barcelona and all that. So that you don't actually because. The idea of a network design comes a little bit from car paradigm, that you are long distance going around nine to five jobs. Yeah? Long distance. If you are doing your daily life, your neighborhood, it's much better to protect your neighborhood. And so both designs are useful, but there is much more tendency to copy the previous paradigm, which is a network design for, for cars. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. The, and the last one, last question to, to you, Mario, seeing as you have the, the microphone, as we say. The, um, um, some of this is intertwined with your own presentation, with the language that we use, the dual speak that can exist, you know, in the transport sector, especially. Um, and, and also providing communities with the language they need to express the concerns that they have. Um, I, I guess two questions. First of all, any advice on how that has progressed over time? You know, mm -hmm. because language is quite cultural in its nature and quite so social in its development. Theme, but you know, what is our role in that? And also, are there any other domains that have done this well? You know, you know are there any other aspects of society where language has been? adjusted to better express the needs of individuals or to better balance these kind of you know dominant paradigms that exist. Well in fact you know that, that language is uh, the frontiers of cultural wars mm. that are being fighted right now on Twitter, on internet and all that. So you know it can be quite extreme but it's something that you know some people say that it's quite bad, some people you know there is but people are very attached to language, so uh, that's something that creates a little bit of a, a backlash as well. Uh, but of course, yes, language is changing. And I, I personally uh, find it is very important because when people changing aspects of their language, they are starting to think differently about it. So, you know, today we had the good news so in Geneva. After 10 years of saying that we should not use accidents on reports, they said, okay, uh, because of WHO, and this is important. It is the health sector that suddenly, because they, they had reports, the WHO had reports saying, you know, uh, this is not an accident. This is something that we can predict and you avoid. Uh, it took 10 years, even with WHO inside of the UN, it took 10 years to change one word. Uh, so we see some progress. And, uh, but also, it's interesting that, for example, when I say to not use vulnerable road users, desirable road users, if I was talking with the road safety person, depending on the context, I might use desirable road users to surprise them, to make them a little bit confused. But sometimes, because we are indeed vulnerable, so sometimes we can use the word vulnerable, and I use them sometimes. But trying to surprise them with those kind of expressions is a very good way, because you can see them smiling and thinking about it. And, uh, and uh, the same thing about the Orwellian way of saying road safety when you're speaking about road danger. <laughs> it's just crazy in a way. All right, Lord, thank you very much, Steve. We're way ahead of time, which is good, so it's just coming up to five past five. Dave, I'm going to let you out early because I know you'll all appreciate that. And um, thanks a lot to our speakers, the, um, um, especially those who are joining us from afar, both in person and online. The, um, maybe another quick last round of applause to those who, who gave their contribution. I'm speaking tomorrow at four o'clock. President, a decade of walking in the past and what walking would look like 30 years into the future in Ireland. That's tomorrow, is it? That's tomorrow, for I mean, everyone's going to be there. I mean, it's going to be queued at the door. All right, thanks a lot, Ian, and enjoy the rest of the conference.